Hello, everybody, again, and welcome again to the second Taste of Vino virtual uh, masterclass with me, Mario Sehik. It's um, about Slovenia and about uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, two very unique and very different countries. But first of all, I know that some of you did not get samples and uh, uh, it's very disappointing for you, but also for me as well. Some samples we sent twice in order to reach, to, to, to reach uh, you. Uh, and it's really, really ridiculous that some famous delivering companies like DHL, UPS, Parcel Force, they are promising next day delivery and they're not doing uh, anything about that. Even we all know the roads are open and goods are transporting very nicely. So again, sorry about that. We're going to record this. Uh, uh, this masterclass again. Uh, my next uh, tasting uh, plan for the next Saturday, uh, we'll have to do it differently. Uh, we'll have to do it two tastings a, a month. So the cutoff time for samples would be at least 10 days before masterclass. So we have enough time really uh, to receive samples. So, so again, sorry, sorry about that. So today masterclass, uh, not one country, two countries. These two countries used to was used to wear one country in which I grew up. So Slovenia was my country, and also um, Bosnia and Herzegovina, as well as Croatia, Serbia, North Ma Northern Macedonia, and Montenegro, which used to form former Yugoslavia. So um, let's start with Slovenia first. Uh, we're gonna have some more wines to taste today than originally planned. Uh, eight wines, four wines from each country. Originally it was supposed to be six, but then I was feeling kind of generous. But also I wanted you to taste some interesting and different wines. Uh, we're going to be also concentrating on two wineries, one from Slovenia, Mr. Walter Sirk, uh, and one from Bosnia Herzegovina, Mr. Josip Berkic, uh, two very, very unique uh, winemakers. So uh, let's start from, uh, for, for, you know, from for Slovenia first, and then we will, we will move on uh, later on to Bosnia and Herzegovina. So Slovenia, where to start with? It's uh, probably we can start with Melania Trump, Mrs. Melania Trump, uh, who actually, she actually put Slovenia on the wider map of the world marrying Mr. Trump, the President of the United States. Uh, she is Slovenian, but also uh, she's not most famous in regards to Slovenia. There's other things which Slovenia is famous for as well, which is like uh, uh, the oldest wine plant in whole of the world is based in Slovenia. It's called Zametovka. Uh, it's uh, uh, 450 years old, and it's the in the in the uh, world uh, book of records, Guinness World Book of Records, as the oldest wine plant still producing grapes. So that's quite amazing. That plant was uh, planted in the Middle Ages. It has survived lots of things like Ottoman uh, uh, Empire uh, siege of the uh, Slovenian attack on that. It's, it has survived uh, bomb bombarding of the Second World War and all of that and still is producing wines, not much, 55, 60 kilos per year. Uh, they regularly produce around 100 small 250 ml bottles out of that wine, which are usually given to some very important or not so important people as gifts. Uh, sadly, I wasn't uh, in that group so far, so I haven't tasted that wine, but it's officially uh, the oldest wine producing plant in the world. That's quite something, you know. Wine plants, the older it gets, it, um, it gives a lot less grapes, but it gives so much, so much more concentration. It's kind of really uh, amazing that we have 450 years old wine plant still producing grapes and making wine. You're gonna see photo of that wine, wine plant later on as we, as we go. So Slovenia is really unique, beautiful, small country in um, Central Europe. Uh, amazing nature, lakes, 
but also also wines. So let me just try to start uh, PowerPoint and uh, let's see. Let's see. Are we working with that or not? And uh, Slovenia, here it is. So we're going to talk about history, wine regions, climate and wine making grape varieties, because it's two countries in the question today. We're not going to uh, do 100 percent in detail, but also we have to focus on eight wines that we're going to taste a little bit later on. So Slovenia, uh, wine making in Slovenia and in those parts of the world where former Yugoslavia have been, you can see here, has been long before Romans introduced uh, winemaking and, and grape growing in countries like France, like Germany and Spain as well. So it got back, goes back again to Illyrian times, old Greek times, that's roughly fifth century before the Christ, a long time, two and a half thousand years approximately. So uh, very, very long history of making of Slovenian wines. So uh, lots of knowledge. Uh, so in the Middle Ages, uh, church, as in many other countries, took over in regards to the wine production and kept um, everything going on. Uh, the biggest boom after that was actually when Slovenia was under Habsburg, Austro-Hungarian uh, uh, country, uh, ruled by a Habsburg family. And then the biggest boom in, in, uh, in uh, Slovenia happened at those times. Uh, after that, Slovenia was part of the Yugoslavia. In Yugoslavia was uh, everything much different. It was a uh, mass production. It was biggest cooperatives built uh, around the around, uh, whole of the country. And uh, the aim was quantity rather than quality. So nothing much happened then. So Slovenia was the first country out of the uh, six which formed former Yugoslavia in 1991 to declare independence. Uh, and uh, in 2006, they joined the EU, so they did really well. Uh, and after that, everything changed for them. They are now really the um, kind of uh, leader uh, country out of all of these six small countries which used to form former Yugoslavia. So if you look at Slovenia, you can see here Slovenia have fantastic geographical location. Uh, in the north, uh, across the Alps, it borders Austria, and then um, uh, on the west, Italy, and then Hungary on the on the east, and South Croatia. So Slovenia is 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 kind of a tiny country, really, uh, but amazingly beautiful. Uh, there's about about twenty three thousand hectares under wines in Slovenia at the moment about 26,000 producers uh, in total, which in total makes about 90 million uh, liters of wines. So most of that is drunk in Slovenia itself. Slovenians are really very near to the top of the league in wine consumption globally. On average, uh, they consume between 45 and 50 liters of wine annually, which is uh, ahead of France or, or, or Spain or, or Italy, really. They are doing their bit uh, to, uh, to support consumption globally, really. So uh, lots, of, lots of wine is, is being produced. Only tiny amount, only about 6 million liters is exported annually, which tells a lot. It's like hidden secret, really, in a way. Slovenia have three major uh, wine growing regions. One is uh, uh, called Podravie, uh, and another one is called Posavie. Drava and Sava, that's two rivers. And usually, everywhere around the world, uh, and later on when we talk about Bosnia and Herzegovina, most of the important wine growing regions are either around rivers or lakes or sea, like this one here, Primorje, as well. So, Podravie is the biggest out of the three. Uh, it's very famous for sparking wine. They started sparking wine production in the same way like uh, method traditional like champagne people do with second fermentation in the bottle in 1890, something like that, long time ago. This area is also very famous for uh, sweet wines. So, same classification in Germany like uh, 
a late harvest, like a, a Auslese, Spätlese, Birenauslese, Trockenbirenauslese, by amount of sweetness in the grapes and wine. And a really world class sweet, sweet wines comes from that region. In this city, charming city called Maribor in Podrave, here you can see, uh, this is where this oldest plant of wine is based and still is. They have a museum which is covered in that plant, and underneath the museum, there's about two and a half, three kilometers of cellar. Cellars dug out uh, for the not only for that plant, of course, it produces very little, but for the wine making, and it's still active wine cellar in that region. So uh, Posavie, uh, second region here on the border with Bos uh, with uh, Croatia, uh, it, it produces lots of interesting wines as well. Climate in these two regions are continental, which means hot uh, summers with very cold winters. While this region here called Primorje, it's quite unique uh, and it's kind of leading region in Slovenia. Uh, it's very close to the Adriatic Sea, very close to Italy as well. And um, basically they produce uh, the most wines, even though the wine growing region is smaller than Podrabje, they produced about 30% more wines than there. And they are kind of leading uh, Slovenian wine, wine kind of industry and, and innovation and all, all of that. Really, it's a uh, it's superb wine region. We're gonna concentrate on one area here called Brda, Gorizian Hill or Goriska Brda, which is uh, just on the other side of Italy. Uh, it actually, a few winemakers, they have half of the vineyards in Italy, half in Slovenia and it's uh, uh, connected to Colio, uh, Colio Orientale and Venezia, Vene Veneto wine region as well. So very unique, it's very beautiful as well. Berda, uh, Gorishka Berda or Gorizia Hills uh, is a um, superbly beautiful region. It's, it's called like um, Slovenian Tuscany because it's hilly, it's, it's beautiful and it produces amazing, amazing variety of wines. So total production out of all wines in Slovenia uh, reaches about nine, uh, 90 million liters. 75% uh, of all wines produced there are white. So uh, some 30% are really, 25% uh, uh, are red. And generally that's the wines which, uh, which are uh, international grape varieties like Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon and blends, and we're gonna we're gonna taste a little bit, little bit of that. So uh, I just forget to mention you have a chat button uh, and question button at the bottom. So please um, uh, chat and tell me what you are what you are doing and where you are joining from, what kind of wines you are drinking, and uh, also um, question button next to it. So we're gonna we're gonna see. Uh, where actually, uh, what questions you might have, and I'm going to address that a little bit later on. So let me just check the uh, chat button here, uh, if I can find it. Um, I have question and answer, but not really chat button here. My assistant is coming up here. Chat button, that's it. There you go. So now, yes. I can see now a uh, chat button and every now and then uh, I'm going to look to check any possible comments you might have. So um, Slovenia, uh, amazing country. I'm trying just to move things a little bit further next. Yeah. So climate is uh, continental in these two regions, Podravia uh, and uh, uh, in these two regions here, Podravia and Posavia uh, around Drava and Sava rivers, purely continental, which means uh, really cold summers, uh, uh, cold winters, uh, hot summers with lots of sun, but then lots of snow in the winter months. Primoria, on the other hand, have really pure Mediterranean climate. Uh, obviously, the major threats for the wines are spring frost, which can happen in the time uh, around uh, March or April when wines are flowering, and that can really uh, destroy the crop. Uh, hot summers means drought, 
And then in summer, there could be really unexpected hail, which can, again, destroy the crop. So uh, vine making is a, is a, and vine growing, grape growing is tricky business, like any other uh, farming business. Uh, so vine makers and grape growers are really, every day when they go out there, just look at the sky and hope none of these uh, uh, things like hail uh, will, will happen. So uh, grape varieties. So here on the left-hand side, this uh, smiling guy is holding in his hand Zametovka. That's actually Blauer Kellner grape variety, 450 years old. And it's uh, every year it still produces, as I was mentioning, a little bit of wine, which, which they pack up in small bottles and give as a gift uh, uh, to, to people they like. Uh, also, uh, Gorishka Burda, uh, where we are concentrating now on, on winery called uh, Walter Sirk. Uh, they are very famous for uh, white wines, of course. Uh, Rebula or Ribola Gaia, this one on the top picture here, uh, is very well known. Uh, it's an uh, uh, old traditional white grape variety, loves that soil, uh, which is called Opoka in, uh, in Gorishka, but the soil is really kind of a layered sunstone and marl, which is, if you are a wine plant, you know, you would love that. It's full of the minerals. It's also poor. It's not too hard for the vines to, to develop uh, uh, long, long um, roots to go really in search for everything that they need. And the another one grape variety here, which I got picture is uh, called Tokai, Tokai Fruliano. Uh, that name has been now, now forbidden a long time ago. In 2006, Hungarians uh, lodged the complaint uh, because, uh, as you know, Hungary is very famous for Tokai, sweet wine, and they forced Italy and, and, and Slovenia to change that into something else. So Tokai <laughs> Fruliano, you will see on one of the samples we're going to have here, uh, now that's relative of um, Sauvignon Blanc. It's one grape variety called Sauvignon uh, Vert or Sauvignonese. So it's something like in between, in between Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc. You can describe it almost like that. So uh, lots of people uh, decided to put just Frulliano then on the label. But some people like Mr. Walter Sirk, he put here, I don't know, can you see it? Yakot, which read other way is Tokai. TF, TF for Tokai Foliano, and here is Yakot, Tokai. So that's kind of quirky way of telling people uh, this is Tokai Foliano, the grape variety they used for centuries over there, the name, but they can't since 2006. So in total, in Slovenia, there's about uh, 52 different grape varieties. 75% are roughly white and rest is uh, red grape varieties. Uh, taking climate in, in, in count, uh, uh, you could expect lighter red wines, uh, lots of Pinot Noir is produced over there, uh, lots, of, lots of lighter styles, uh, Blau Frankish as well, and, and Blau Erzweiger too. So, uh, you would expect that in, in climate which is continental, which is not really hot like, like, uh, like area we discussed last time. Croatia, very hot, 90, 95% of all grapes produced there are red. So um, uh, very unique, very interesting uh, grape varieties. So basically what they do in Gorishka Berta with white grape varieties traditionally, they always, almost always, use some oak barrel aging for them. Also, what they like, they like skin contact with the juice, with the, with the white wines. Uh, lots of white wines produced nowadays globally are produced to be fresh. As soon as the grapes are crushed, juice released, skins are separated, and then lots of that is just fermented in stainless steel tanks to preserve those aromatics and freshness and fruitiness but not in Gorish Kabarda. Traditionally, they would use 
uh, oak barrels, Slovenian oak barrels, also Slavonian oak barrels, uh, which is from Croatia. And almost always they would be giving some sort of uh, skin contacts like cold maceration, and then almost always keeping some finished wines on their leaves. That produces something else that, that gives body and structure to some of the wines. So these wines are quite distinctive as you, you will see when we, when we start tasting them. They are for me uh, ideal food wines. Mr. Walter Silk uh, supplies two or three Michelin star restaurants uh, around in Italy as well. Uh, and in Slovenia, a couple of days ago, uh, the, uh, the first time ever, it's kind of historic moment on 19th of this month, that they, uh, they, they, they have given six Michelin stars. So Slovenia is becoming also gourmet destination as well. One lady uh, has uh, got two Michelin stars, which is kind of unusually in the same time. So uh, Mr. Walter Silk supplies some of his wines to some top end restaurants. And I think these wines are really, really perfect food wines as well. So uh, let's move on to the tasting here. Here uh, you can see Silk family. He's got now uh, two kids. His dad is still active and, and his mom, but uh, he started and restarted old family business in 1991, as soon as they declared independence, basically. So he has um, uh, expanded uh, vineyards to six hectares now. They are producing about 40,000 or so bottles of different wines per year. 90% uh, 90, 90 of his, his white wines is uh, producing, uh, we're gonna taste uh, two single varietal wines, and we're gonna taste also two blends, but he does produce this uh, Malvasia from a uh, uh, very well known Istria, from Istria region. Uh, he's got that in his vineyards. Uh, he's producing also uh, uh, Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay and, and other international grape varieties. So fairly small production. You can see on the right hand side photo here. This is beautiful uh, town of uh, Berda, Goriska Berda. And you can see it really looks a little bit like like uh, Tuscany, it really is, is amazingly beautiful and the food and wine culture is, is just as, as, as in Italy here. So uh, we're gonna have four wines to taste with him, uh, uh, his wines. So let me check first one. So we're gonna start with Rebol, Rebola or Ribola Gaia 2017. So 2017, so he calls these first two wines fresh wines, even though uh, they have spent some uh, skin contact to add structure and body uh, to the wines, but also uh, they have spent about nine to 10 months on the leaves to increase, uh, to increase concentration of the wine. So Rebula is a fantastic grape variety. It is, uh, descendant of, uh, of, uh, Fer of Furmint. Uh, one of the parents uh, of the Furmint is also a uh, rebel uh, parent. So it's um, quite unique, quite distinctive. Uh, it can produce really um, orange wines as well. So two of the wine makers who actually, well, one, one firstly, Mr. Joško Gravner, uh, he's from that region as well, not from Goriska Alberta, but just across the border uh, to Italy from Colio. Uh, and uh, he started single-handedly about 24, 25 years ago to, uh, to, st uh, to start production of orange wines. And now it's really taken off everywhere. Orange wines are, of course, not produced from orange, but it's got that color from the grape variety. And Rebula is just perfect for that kind of thing. So Mr. Gramner is generally keeping skins in touch with juice all the time. It's like red wine making and produces some of the most distinctive orange wines on, on earth really. So, uh, so when, when, when in touch with, with wood, uh, with aging, Rebula is very well known that it can age properly, it can age uh, uh, and, and, and oak barrels can add 
lots of concentration and lots of stuff to this grape variety. So let's let's check it out and let's see let's see what you think. Let me again check the chat chat button, question and answer. I'm gonna come to that later on. But the chat button again here has gone somewhere else. I'm gonna check it in a second. Okay. So uh, let's let's taste this wine. It's a young wine, 2017. Uh, Mr. Walter Sig described this as a fresh wine. Um, I would say it's not as fresh as we here would expect it because it has that concentration taken out of the skins, but also nine, 10 months aging on the leaves, which is dead yeast. So let's check what's happening here. Uh, my first uh, notes there was like hint of smoke and nut. Savory tone on the on the smell. So let's check. Is that is that correct? Yes, yeah, still it's kind of savory tone and nutty. It's not aromatic, and that is thanks to the uh, different wine making method that Mr. Sip is doing, uh, with with the uh, lease aging and and uh, and skin contact as well. So let's let's taste this. This is complex wine. Hope you are agreeing with me. It does have uh, that like pear and tangerine and kind of minerality from that soil uh, called the poca. It is richly textured. It, it's got that refreshing acidity on the side, but also that kind of minerality covers a little bit of your, of your tongue as well. And it's got fairly long finished. It's kind of different. It's interesting. It's not your standard uh, type of wine, but I quite like it. It's quite interesting to taste something something like this. It, uh, for obvious reasons for me, this is food wine. It's got body and structure. Uh, it's got, it, it's kind of medium body for me. It's got body and structure to really, uh, you know, um, to be paired with variety of, of medium uh, bodied uh, foods as well, creamy, vicious, that kind of thing. So let me know uh, what you think, do you like it or not? I think it's, it's, it's delicious. Yeah, so it's 13% um, of alcohol. Uh, it says here it's dry on the label. Uh, it says quality wine in Slovenia. They have three or four different levels, <laughs> starting like uh, with table wines, like anywhere else. Uh, uh, called Nemizno Vino, uh, and then uh, like anywhere else, it's uh, like quality wine, wine, uh, you know, from geographic, uh, uh, approved geographic locations, and then it's a premium quality wine, and it's, uh, there is also a board of tasters who decides on, on this, on this qualification. So this is uh, delicious, this is different, and I hope you are enjoying this as much as I do. It's very interesting. So moving to our next wine, which is, which is Tokai. Tokai Friuliana, which is not any more uh, uh, legal term for this wine. So Tokai Fruliano, uh, another interesting, uh, fantastic, unique grape variety. It's grown in Italy as well. Uh, we don't see many of these wines in UK. As you know, as I was mentioning, Slovenians are drinking all up themselves, uh, or most of it. And this wine has been uh, 20% of that has been in acacia barrels. That's quite interesting. And acacia barrels are very long, high, uh, very long uh, tradition, in, uh, in, especially in, in Gorizia and Hill, in, in Gorishka Borda. And acacia gives 
something which all ballots don't give. It's specific kind of aromatics. Uh, and then uh, after, after 10 months, 80% in stainless steel, 20% in acacia ballast. After 10 months, they are joined together, again with leaves, and again doing uh, mixing them up with uh, batonage, and the resulting, uh, uh, resulting wine is quite interesting and quite uh, different. So again, same year, 2017, and again, 13% of alcohol for this wine. So let me put a sample for myself and uh, tell me if I'm going too fast or too slow, too slow for you. And again, I'm gonna open chat button and let's see if you have any comments on this, on this wine. Yeah, you can tell by the color, it's fairly young wine. It's like pale, light, lemony, greenish kind of color, which is a 100% sign that this has seen no, no substantial aging. And um, uh, also you can see there is some tears or legs a little bit, which tells me it is 13%. And let's smell and let's check what we think about, about this wine. Uh, really is, is, is completely different smell than, than Debula. I think that 20% in a case of barrel uh, adds a little bit something different to the smell. It's quite intriguing type of smell for me. Hope you have your wines uh, on proper temperatures. Uh, temperatures are for me Okay, I, I can see from Victoria uh, enjoying this one. Very well balanced, full in the mouth, and incredible finish. I agree 100% with that. It's very distinctive. It's quite minerally. It's almost tropical fruits at the back, but also that 20% of uh, acacia barrels gives really interesting smell to this wine. I think it's... Um, it's very distinctive, very unique, very different style of the wine, really. I enjoy this a lot. It is a little bit fruitier, uh, this wine, uh, but then again, the fruitiness can come from acacia barrels as well to give that spiciness and fruitiness. Uh, uh, as well, so it's it's um, it's delightful. It's it's unusual. All of these wines I have chosen for today, they are slightly different. Uh, every now and then, we all need something a little bit different. Okay, we can have our favorite uh, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc every now and then. But really, what we like, what most of us who love wines like, is to to check out some different, some little bit maybe quirky wines and. And something like that. And, and these first two wines are exactly, exactly like that. So let's see our next wine. Let's check that. So this is now blend. This is now blend. You can see Teresa Bianco. Teresa is a, a part of the family, a silk family. So Chardonnay 45%, Pinot Bianco 30%, Malvasia from Istria 25%. So these people, especially from Gorishka Berda, they are really masters in blends. Blends uh, are really something special. I love blends. Some of the most expensive wines on earth are always blends. Chateau Lafitte, Chateau Latour, uh, you know, most expensive wines are really almost always blends. Blending is an art. Blending is knowledge and tradition. And it's really uh, aim for blending is that each grape variety should contribute to make that final product better than separate ingredients. So Teresa Bianco, let's see. And let's check what you think. This is now a little bit older wine with longer pro pro uh, aging. This is 2015. Uh, longer aging uh, usage of oak barrels instead of the 
uh, stainless steel. Uh, so a prolonged uh, time on yeast, yeast as well, uh, 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 lease as well. And it's a little bit darker in color here. You can see it's not, uh, well, in your glass, but compared to the previous two ones we had, this is not palish like lemony. It's like more going towards more golden deep lemon color. So let's let's check this wine. I'm gonna just check the shot again. And let's check this wine and let's see what you what you think. Again, very different smell. Pleasant. Influence of oak. You can see that. You can smell that. No, this is, um, Steven said, can I check Q, uh, yeah, question and answer. So I'm gonna come to that towards, towards end of, the, uh, of this tasting. For now, I'm just checking chat uh, box. So we're gonna come to that. So this is uh, deliciously complex. This reminds me of, um, of uh, Burgundy, not Chablis, but a little bit further south, um, Cote du uh, It's really complex, it's interesting, it's smoky. Uh, acidity is there, it's lively. It's got that caramel aroma and it's really, really... Uh, can I check a question? Uh, um, please mention price. Uh, I will do that, yes, I will do that later on. Uh, all prices, all of these wines are on my website, Taste of Vino. They are all available, of course, for sale, so you can easily check uh, all of the prices for all of these wines we are tasting uh, now. So yes, uh, I think it's a really superb wine. Uh, hope you agree with me, but this is complex, this is interesting, uh, this is opens up even now, even better now, uh, after, after a while. Uh, and it's uh, it's a lovely, lovely wine. Hope you like that. Let me know. Do you like it or do you hate it? In my view, there's nothing to hate. I think it's quite, quite a superb wine. Okay, so um, additional wine, which I have uh, included, uh, not, not initially planned, is red wine. This area is very well known for, uh, I think it is wonderful, uh, wine. Uh, so this area is very well known for Bordeaux blends as well. And they are really, really interesting. They are really well made. So we're gonna, we're gonna have next wine, uh, which is Teresa Rosso. It's almost typical Bordeaux blend, Merlot, Cabernet Franc. Well, Merlot would be uh, right hand, uh, right side of the Bordeaux towards uh, Chateau Petrus, uh, Cabernet Franc, and Malbec. So it's it's approximately Bordeaux blend. Again, it's uh, 2015, uh, slightly uh, older wine. And let's see what it said here, it's 13.5%, uh, 2015 was uh, hot year, I remember that, in Slovenia and in Croatia as well. And uh, let's see, let's see about this wine. I just cleaned my glass with some of the water and prepared for the, this red wine. So let's check this. Okay, so <laughs> these are my uh, notes taken a few weeks ago when I initially tasted these wines, but let's see, uh, can we spot any, any of that or maybe something else as well. It's really perfumey, aromatic, uh, interesting, amazing smell really. So, uh, very promising. When you smell wine like this, you know it's going to be promising. Generally, 
uh, smell sh should only, and taste only should confirm the smell really. And this is complex, this is perfumey, this is dark fruits, spices for monk barrels. It's really, really promising, promising smell. So let's, let's uh, taste this. Wow. If I was tasting this blind, I would be immediately drawn to Bordeaux area. It's um, elegant. It's not big. It's not, uh, yeah, black forest gut. Exactly, black forest gut, yeah. Dark chocolate, tight touch on that as well. It's, it's really um, uh, elegant wine. It's not like muscle. It's not like, uh, you know, kind of a, uh, in, in your face, but it's kind of elegant, lots of everything going on. And, uh, and uh, really it's, it's, it's very interesting what's happening there. So I have lost for now uh, something here. Let me just try to find, uh, Sharing is posed. I don't know why, uh, but let me check why sharing is full posed. It happened on its own. So let me see uh, while we are enjoying this wine. Yes, uh, it happened on its own. So yeah, this is, um, in my view, delicious. It reflects that climate as well, which is not too hot. It, it has Mediterranean influence but not too hot. And it's really uh, wonderfully, wonderfully made. Uh, this wine maker, Mr. Sirk, uh, really, I think he's very good at blends as well. So delicious wine. Let me know if you like it or not. Mm. really balanced. It's lots of everything going on. It's a long finish. It's a great acidity as well. It's, it's not boring. Wine without acidity would be flat and boring, really. The grape juice acidity is needed in white wines. Uh, it's always a little bit more than in red, but then red wine without acidity is, is, is boring. Acidity gives freshness. And I think that's, that's very, very important. So delicious four wines from one particular region called Gorishka Brda in, uh, in Slovenia. And one particular winemaker, Mr. Walter Sirk, he's a fourth generation. Uh, he's still a youngish guy. And I think he's gonna be making better and better wines. These are great, but I think he's got that touch. You know, the, some winemakers have it. So they have that touch and you can recognize uh, Dave Wines, and I think he's got that touch, that particular kind of touch for the wine making. Right, so uh, let's move to Bosnia and Herzegovina. If I may change this, let's check, yes. So yeah, we're gonna discuss a few things in regards to Bosnia and Herzegovina as well. So very, very different country than Slovenia. Uh, as I was mentioning, they used to was their part of the same country, but even in those times, I'm cleaning my glass for the uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina vines. So even in those times, they were very different, even though the one country, Slovenia, was always a little bit more advanced than the rest of the Yugoslavia. And today, uh, it's even more uh, in that sense, in everything, not only in vines. Uh, very, very different. So Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, you know, it's like uh, land on the crossroads. Uh, it has been under Ottoman Empire for a very long time, where wine production dropped uh, drastically because Ottomans are Muslims and no wine allowed, except they were very sympathetic to the churches. So churches continue to make wines, even in those uh, times under Ottoman Empire. Uh, and then under Austro-Hungarians, 
same like Slovenians, and then Yugoslavia. So finally, they are now independent, but they, are, they have much more troubles than Slovenia. They are kind of uh, divided in two or three different kind of separate small countries, and they are not liking each other yet. And that reflects in many different things. But wine is kind of big tradition, same like in Slovenia, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, wine making and history of wine goes back to the Illyrian times. That area as well has been, uh, here you can see on this picture over there, has been under, under, under Illyria at those times as well. So history very rich, very long, stopped for some 500 years ago, but then the best uh, uh, under Ottoman Empire, but then the best and golden times for winemaking in Bosnia and Herzegovina came under uh, Austro-Hungarians. So uh, they recognized uh, the locations of the vineyards, they recognized two of the indigenous grape varieties, you're gonna taste them today, and they actually supported planting, they built roads and railways, and actually they have been enjoying those wines in, uh, in their major uh, Hofburg Palace in, in Vienna, which then opened up those wines uh, to have claim really international kind of celebrity status, nothing like, like what we are seeing today. So here on this picture here, you can see first winery in, uh, formed there uh, under Austro-Hungarians in 1893. It's quite remarkable to see, uh, you know, these pictures. I wonder these guys, uh, if they are alive and if they come into the uh, new wineries today, which are like state of the art, they would be, they would be kind of uh, not believing what they're seeing. But yeah, that's that's wine making going back for a very very long time. So uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina is a small country. Let me see. You can see here. So uh, main wine regions are around city of Mostar, Sultan, Herzegovina. There are a few very few wine re uh, regions over here in this northern part, about three or four percent. But then uh, the climate in Sarajevo and climate in Mostar, which is about two hours drive apart by car, is very different. Uh, Sarajevo lies on the like 550 uh, meters above sea level. It's got, we have to remember there was uh, Olympic Games held in Sarajevo. Uh, during Yugoslavia time, so lots of snow in the winter months. And here it's typical Mediterranean influence. So uh, it's, it's uh, mild, uh, this is flatland area, leading, uh, you know, allowing Mediterranean air to reach all of that. So very hot summers, very mild winters. Uh, again, rivers are very, very important. Uh, this area here, uh, which you can see these stony vineyards, this is very close to the uh, Mr. Josip Berkic winery, uh, where he lives in Chitluk uh, city. And you can see these grapes uh, seems like to grow out of the rock limestone. And I've been there, it's, it's quite remarkable that this grape variety can do something like this. This uh, picture here, this is picture of the uh, vineyards in Trebinje, that's uh, Eastern, uh, Herzegovina, where some of these people here have been making wines in a Tvrdoš monastery from uh, God from 15th century. These people are now, uh, even under Ottoman Empire, as I was saying, these people are now uh, exporting those wines uh, to 23 countries, really. So, but similar in, in a similar climate, uh, Mediterranean climate. In the city of Trebinje, Eastern Herzegovina, there is a river called Trebišnica. Again, lots of vineyards are around there, as I was mentioning, importance of rivers or lakes or sea before. And in Herzegovina, Chitluk and this area, Western Herzegovina, uh, the river Neretva, amazingly beautiful river, which goes from the city of Mostar uh, and goes not far from, uh, from Dubrovnik into the sea. So uh, two very different soil structures and climate. You can see around here, there's a plateau where Mr. Josip Berkic have his vineyards, which is pure stone, limestone, karst. And then uh, Western Herzegovina, uh, Eastern Herzegovina around the city of Trebinje, you can see here, it's got more richer soil. You can see here this brownish soil, this is much more richer, richer soil and it's much more uh, flatter uh, area as well. So uh, quite rich history 
in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, and uh, basically today there is about 6,300 hectares on the wine. Uh, <coughs> in Bosnia and Herzegovina, there's an additional 700 hectares in the Republic of Srpska, which Trebinje belongs to that. Uh, total production land stays at around, let's say, I think it's around 7 million liters of wines, comparing to Slovenia, 90 million liters of wines. But now with this explosion in wine popularity globally, it's catching up in Bosnia and Herzegovina and elsewhere as well. There's only about 50 producers of wine in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but there's about 11,000 households who actually make wines for themselves. So they're not, they are producers, but only for themselves. So it's kind of really, really unique. Two grape varieties, very unique grape varieties, stands out. One is called Blat uh, Žilavka, Žilavka here, white one, and Blatina, red one. So basically that two indigenous major, most important grape varieties in Bosnia and Herzegovina. There are some international grape varieties, of course, grown uh, over there, Cabernet Sauvignon, Ch uh, Chardonnay, and so on. But these are the two most important grape varieties. So uh, this grape variety here on the on, on, on left-hand side, Žilavka, uh, general kind of uh, pronunciation and translation of that would be strong roots. That's one way of, of, of looking at that. The other one is small veins, sometimes which shows under the skins of the grapes. So whatever happens, Žilavka is, in my view, strong roots, uh, heat resistance. Uh, temperatures in these areas around the city of Mostar can reach into summer 40 degrees Celsius. That's a lot. Uh, and they, they need to develop strong roots to survive. So Žilavka is strong, powerful wine, uh, grape, uh, wine plant, uh, and hence the name Žilavka. Uh, it is... Uh, indigenous to Croatia. Uh, uh, as I was mentioning, Austro-Hungarians uh, recognized that those two grapes long time ago and uh, golden times came in those times, uh, especially, especially with, with, uh, with them importing them in a way to Vienna. And uh, these two wines have been winning gold medals in 1927 and 1937 as well in Brussels, uh, in London, in, uh, in Paris as well. So that was kind of big, big uh, thing for these two grape varieties, which are now quite, quite uh, rare in a way outside Bosnia and Herzegovina. So, um, Žilavka is fantastic white grape variety. Uh, Mr. Josip Brkic, he's the first uh, biodynamic winemaker in, in, in Bosnia. And he started that actually quite a long time ago. We met about 14, 15 years ago. I had an academy of wine accredited by WSET in Bosnia Herzegovina. And I met him and I wrote uh, uh, a few good things about his wines in local papers. But I was too early. I was like 10 years too early. Boom in Bosnia Herzegovina, it's just happening like five, six, eight, nine years ago. So he actually uh, makes uh, wines, he switched completely to biodynamic. Uh, organic and then biodynamic. Uh, so that was quite, quite big change for him and his vineyards. He said his vineyards suffered the shock initially first year or so until the uh, vines recognized that and started to fight. And then he treated them with all of the kind of uh, uh, biodynamic natural forms like nettle and this and that. So he actually uh, uh, is uh, making wines uh, in the last 15 years, uh, very different than anybody else. Uh, lots, of, lots of them, lot, lots of other winemakers have been following him. Uh, so you will see with his wines uh, what, what I mean. He uses Bosnian oak barrels. So when I met him first, you can see even here, the, one of them is tiny, one of them is a bit bigger, one of them is, they're all, they're all different size. As uh, they don't have experience like in France, in Bordeaux, about, uh, you know, cooperage and making Wine. So he's got specific guy in central Bosnia who is using Bosnian oak, and I, I think they matches perfectly with, with his wines. So uh, uh, let's let's start let's start tasting tasting his wines. 
So Zilovka, yeah. So this is 2017. Zilovka can age. Zilovka is a really interesting grape variety. And this is made in, uh, uh, in really uh, like fresh, fresh style. But again, he uh, tends his uh, vineyards uh, organically and he makes his wines uh, naturally. Uh, naturally means uh, as less interference as possible. So let's check 13.5 uh, in alcohol and let's check what you think about this one. Ooh. Jilavka is fantastic grape variety. It can produce very light, aromatic, uh, 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 interesting wines, which is kind of surprising for the hot climate. Uh, so let me switch the, uh, the uh, chat button to see if you like this or do you hate it or what comments you might have. Uh, and yeah, let's, let's, let's taste this one. Let's see what you, what you think. Smells great, it smells complex, smells interesting. It's quite unique. Uh, herby spice, fragrance, and then your description hit the nail. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, wild herbs. Uh, uh, this area, when it's very hot around the uh, city of Mostar, when you walk in the vineyards, you can smell all of the wild herbs, and it's 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 really a superb smell. And it's it's typical Mediterranean style of the wine. Still, it's not overly powerful. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's kind of a thirteen point five all of alcohol. Okay, it's slightly higher than what we what we want here maybe, but then that alcohol is in perfect balance with everything else. This is like delicious, interesting uh, uh, Mediterranean style of the unique white wine. Touch of spearmint, probably. Um, it's very complex. It's, it's, uh, this is uh, Mr. Berkic um, uh, entry level wine. And I'm, I'm always, always fascinated how attention he puts on all level wines, all all wines he makes. It's quite distinctive, I would say. Very different, I like this a lot. So yeah, um, really, really interesting. Okay, so next wine, let me see. Yeah, I have to switch the chat box off first. And then, so now this is one level above. Greda is the name of the vineyard. It's a single vineyard, uh, which Mr. Berkic owns, Josip Berkic. Uh, and he uh, really is um, like uh, uh, adding touch of complexity to this wine. First, he picking best location, uh, uh, you know, hand selection of the wine, but also longer aging in new oak uh, for about 12 months. So uh, this is kind of, a, in his view, one level up above basic entry level Jilavka, which I like very much so. So this is 2015. You can see that. Bit of age there. And let's see that single vineyard wine. It's very deep in color, I can tell immediately. It's kind of golden uh, color there. Alcohol level, 12%. I have to put my glasses on, it is 12%. And uh, let's, let's try this wine. Let's see what this wine is about. Smell is really, really complex. It's uh, 
distinctive, it's unusual, it's uh, Let's try. This is something else. Uh, the smell is very com uh, complex. It's really a combination of everything, including orange peels, including uh, uh, tropical fruits, include it's very complex wine as well but it's got again that minerality which covers your tongue and lively acidity which coats your sides of the mouth but it stays with you it's uh, it's really uh, you know um, interesting that 12 percent alcohol alcohol always uh, add or should add more to the body and structure of the wine uh, but it's really, really interesting. It's complex. It's, it's delicious. What do you think? Really unique. It's got that dry uh, orange peel finish. Well, tastes are very different. Yeah, we, we're all very subjective in, in tastes, but uh, that's why it's so interesting. But then uh, uh, the, this wine and previous wine, yeah, in, in my assessment of the quality, this wine is one level above by the quality, by the complexity, by the things going on, and also overall balance and finish. So, uh, I love it, especially 12%. I mean, yeah, you know, it's uh, it's very difficult to make big wine with low alcohol level, as as I was mentioning, alcohol always add, or almost always add uh, to a little bit more body and structure and, 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 uh, and complexities. So, So shall we move? Shall we move on? Let me switch this, and let's see what's next. Now this is his top end wine. This wine is uh, made by all biodynamic principles, and it's made in so tiny quantities. It's kind of insane. Let me see. This is bottle two hundred sixty four number out of 796 produced. So this is always tiny production, two or three tiny small Bosnian oak barrels. But this wine has been uh, made for years now. And what he do, uh, he picks grapes for this wine for very specific location. But also what he do, he have all of the friends and family around for four days. They are hand picking grape by grape, separating them. So all natural yeast are used. Uh, it's uh, like uh, carbonic maceration. I don't know, have you heard the term? Uh, sometimes it, it's done in France, but always is done in Bourgeois in France. Uh, so each individual grape, the fermentation starts from inside the grape. So he do that uh, and he keep that together for nine months. In Bosnian, in Bosnian oak barrels. It's quite uh, following, of course, moon and all of that. It's quite remarkable attention to detail uh, and attention to, 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 to production of this wine. And it's made 100% by Mr. Joseph Steiner biodynamic principles. So let's, let's try that. Okay, let, before I do that, I'm going to start the chart as well. So let's see, uh, you can see by the, in the color, so this is 2016, you can see by the color, it's really deep golden color. It's lots of color uh, from almost uh, orange uh, wine, uh, principle wine making, but this is something else. So let's, let's smell and let's see what we can find here. 
Now this is powerful, this is intense, this is um, uh, really a lot of things going on there. Uh, it's kind of orangey, it's dried fruit, it's, it's lots of lots of complexities over there. It's really, really remarkable smell. Promising smell. Let's, let's taste it. What do you think? This is complex. This is different. And it's really alive. Alcohol level, let's check this, is 12.7. Generally, it's like uh, in the last few years, like 12.5 or 13, it's uh, 0 0.5 uh, level. But he put specifically 12.7 as, as it is. So it's on the lower end, but it's really, really complex, really interesting. And uh, it's 100% Jilak. Any comments? You like it? You hate it? I doubt that somebody can hate one of these. Hmm. I imagine this wine with lobster, buttery lobster, with prawns, uh, with kind of that kind of food would be just amazingly perfect. I'm pulling my two big sample back in a bottle. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think it's uh, it's really really superb. Right, so let's let's move to our last wine. We are a little bit over the time, but it doesn't matter, as we have two countries now to deal with. And this is uh, another second most important grape variety in Bosnia Herzegovina, which is uh, Blatina. Blatina is a superb, superb grape variety. Uh, again, contrary to what you might expect in uh, that climate, very hot climate, a rocky soil, uh, Blatina produces uh, like Pinot Noir style of the wines, more like cherry fruits, perfumey, light, interesting, but also it can produce powerful wines as well. So this is uh, quite interesting, quite indigenous, quite a unique red grape variety. So Platina is also very difficult grape as it uh, really, it, it has only female flowers. So it needs male kind of uh, grape uh, planted around. So it's kind of difficult to work with. Usually they would plant uh, uh, grape, a local grape variety called Ternyak or Alicante Boucher, uh, or even Vranas or, 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 or some, uh, some, something else, uh, just to make pollination. So it's one of the handful of the uh, uh, single uh, sex, uh, if you like, the grape variety. So let's, let's taste Blatina. So this is, uh, again, made by organic and biodynamic uh, way. It's, uh, again, name of the uh, vineyard and uh, local native na Bosnian oak, uh, indigenous yeast, all of the organic and biodynamic principles that he uses. And uh, this is 2017, and it's got 12.5 alcohol level. So let's see, let's see how this tastes like and smells like. Oh, perfumey, cherry, red fruits mixed with a 
with kind of a, a, a black fruits. It's it's uh, it's really interesting. So I'm gonna start the chat again. So uh, let's let's see what you think. It's passion. Cherry, it's like eating fresh cherries. Lively acidity. Touch of tannins, that drying sensation, not much, not unpleasant. Um, delicious. This wine like this, it's, it's kind of medium bodied. It's not powerful, but it could be slightly chilled like towards the white, towards the white wines. And um, enjoyed with uh, even with seafood, with bluefish, with the uh, bluefish meaning tuna or salmon or, or mackerel. It's, it's absolutely delicious. Mm. What's your thought on this one? Okay. <coughs> so Stephen is saying number three is, is, is for them the best. Number three was uh, uh, Slovenian uh, Teresa White, I think. Uh, blend, uh, delicious wine, yes. But you know, with, with wines, uh, like with food, basically um, it's very subjective. So yeah, but we can agree that those, those wines are really uh, different, very unique, uh, but also as always importance of food, we always should think, and I always do, which wine should match with food, which food should even make better that wine and which wine make, make that harmony with that food. So. So it's really, really uh, important. Uh, yeah, this is very fruity, interesting, different wines. So all of the these eight wines I have chosen for you tonight has been chosen for a specific reason. They have something different, they have something you need, they are indigenous, they are local, but also for me is always important the wine maker. Wine, I, I, I like when I taste the wine that I see person behind, that I see his influence, that I see his passion and I think I think we can see that in these in these wines indeed so uh, let me see what's next so my next tasting I've decided to move one week uh, uh, after June 27th in regards to the samples I have to make sure that samples reaches people who are ordering them so I'm going to post my next date. It's going to be a Saturday after uh, the June 27th. And also I'm planning my next day's things for the July, uh, but it's going to be only two. So we, we, we really uh, have to make sure that you get samples. It's, it's, it's important. Uh, also questions. Uh, let's see questions. There are some questions. Okay, it's not opening for some reason. Chat is there. But questions. Questions are not there. So my miraculous little assistant is here. And hopefully Hopefully we're gonna be able to open that in a second. Chat is there, but not, we can't open question button for some reason. Maybe we should stop share. Yeah, we can do that. Okay, now, yes. Right, let me get my glasses. Uh, Stephen Winch, is this the same grape you get on Cephalonia, uh, which, wine you are referring to that i'm not sure i don't think uh kefalonia in greece if if that's what you think is uh connected with these wines 
uh, acacia is um, less porous than French oak, but it's more spicy. Uh, traditionally, it has been uh, used for for very long time, and still occasionally, it's more spicy, uh, less porous, more um, more of everything really. So that's why they're keeping usually wines for ten months, not like twenty four months in, in French or American oak. Uh, prices, uh, yeah, they, they are all on my web website. Member uh, which makes biodynamic wines. Which method does he use to make them organic? So um, biodynamic and organic. Organic uh, is uh, uh, organic. Uh, they have the um, use of sulfur dioxide and and, and uh, copper, uh, but he does, in biodynamic they don't. They use only natural ingredients. So biodynamic is kind of one level up above uh, organic. So um, methods uh, in biodynamics are uh, that he treats or, or they treat cellar. Uh, and and uh, and uh, uh, vineyards and uh, uh, universe as one entity. So they will do specific work in the vineyard or in the cellar uh, based on the uh, uh, moon, uh, lunar moves. Uh, some of the most expensive wines on earth, like Domain Romane Conti, is uh, biodynamic. Uh, uh, Teresa Rosso, selling Tyne. Uh, I think it's about, uh, it's got good structure, good good of everything. I think it's not too long. I think it's about next five, six years, really. I think it's great now, but I think five, six years, uh, yeah. Uh, I don't pay my assistant yet. When I start <laughs> making money, they're going to, they're going to, uh, uh, yeah, my assistant going to get some money <laughs> or, or maybe wine. We'll see. Um, and yeah, uh, so uh, I do. I do hope you you, you all enjoyed uh, this a little bit longer than usually. But well, it's two countries. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, masterclass, uh, of course, all of the wines you tasted. Uh, again, to mention, you can buy them on my website. There's prices as well, and I will be posting uh, the next wine tasting, which would be uh, wine and food. Uh, planned for the next Saturday, it's going to be delayed uh, uh, because of the delivering sample. So, I uh, hope you enjoy, oh, enjoyed everything and uh, hope I'm going to see you in, in two weeks' time again. Uh, please email me if you have any questions more and have a, have a great uh, evening and uh, thanks for joining.